So tonight's guests, I met them as usual, you know, doing my engaging on LinkedIn. You know, LinkedIn is a place, a treasure trove of people and of opportunity. And I was really happy to connect with Miss Manessa Lorma Just. Please let me know if I'm correct, pronounced it correctly. <laughs> Laura Just, and she is a beauty scientist and cosmetic chemist, and she is really coming to give us the gems tonight about beauty formulations and some of the things you really need to know if you're looking to um, launch your beauty brand. So, Manessa, close up that caviar and take your final sips of champagne. It is your turn to come out on the stage. I want to welcome you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Manessa to the lipstick effect. Hi, Thank Manessa. You. How are you? I'm doing so well. Thank you so much for having me. I am very glad that you are here and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So, Manessa, so for the for the guests or for the folks who are not familiar with you on these ends, do a quick introduction. Tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're from. Sure. So I've worked in the beauty industry now as both a cosmetic mm -hmm. chemist and product developer. Um, during my time as a cosmetic chemist, I worked for L'Oreal working on hair and skincare products um, across different brands, different market segments, and really understanding what it is to develop a product from brief to launch, right? So what are the, the testing requirements, how, you know, you develop skincare versus a hair color product and why different uh, safety regulations are in place um, respective to the different formulas. And then I had a personal interest in skincare. Like I always joke that my entire bathroom is like 70% skin and then like 10% hair care products. And so um, I switched internally um, to the skincare team, learned more about developing products on that side. And then I pivoted to product development because I wanted to work in a role that was a little bit more brand facing. I think at the time I felt like there was a big disconnect between the people formulating in the lab and what marketing's expectations were. And I always felt like you, we had the same goal, we just didn't speak the same language. And a lot of times like that would cause like headaches or hiccups in the product development life cycle. And I just wanted to be a part of the PD team because I felt like that would be um, kind of like ameliorating my skill sets while also building myself on like a business and, and development perspective. And so I was able to jump ship and do that at Forma Brands, which is a beauty incubator based in San Francisco. Very, very cool. Uh, okay. All right. So I see on your website that you describe, no, I think I may you describe yourself as a girly nerd? Is that what you said? A girly you, nerd, yes. Yeah, is that you always had an interest um, in chemistry. So tell us a little bit. Tell us a little bit about that. Where did that start? Is it that you, you your parents how, exposed you to science as a young as a young lady? How did that work out? So that's a great question. Um, I will say my interest in chemistry started when I was in high school. So. I've always been smart, right? Like, so that means like I, I got A's in every category, right? But mm -hmm. I never really like, I used to want to be a doctor, but that's because I'm Caribbean, I'm Haitian. So in my house, it's like, you got to be a doctor, engineer, or a lawyer. Like there's really yeah. only the top three professions. Um, and so I always thought I wanted to be a doctor. And then I took chemistry and I started understanding um, about like actives in terms of like active materials. And like, I think salicylic acid was like the first ingredient I like learned about on like Wikipedia and like understood like the molecular structure and all these things. And I was like, wow, like that's pretty cool. Like people like know molecules and then understanding just basically like general chemistry. I realized like I actually wanted to do pharmacology. So I wanted to be a pharmacologist and I had these big ambitions that I would cure HIV and I, I would do cancer research and all the things that like I would see on TV. And I was like, well, I want to do that kind of research. And I always feel like you have one plan and then God kind of like directs you and in, in where you're supposed to be because I applied to three different pharmacy schools. Um, I got into two, but the one school I could actually afford, I didn't get into. And so at mm -hmm. that school, which is Rutgers University, I, um, I just majored in chemistry. And one day I'm like Googling, literally me and Google, we're like this, like <laughs> me and Google, we go way back. Um, I'm like Googling like, 
what does a chemist do? Like I'd, I've never, i had never met a chemist before, right? I've never met a chemist. I've never met somebody that worked in the beauty industry, let alone anybody that looked like me. So I really had nowhere to start but Google. And I started Googling. I even like through my school, they had a career portal and the portal would tell you like, oh, if you have this major, here's the type of work you could do. So I started seeing this term like cosmetic chemist. And I was like, what is that? So then I Googled that and my mind literally exploded. I was like, this is what I'm <laughs> supposed to do. Like, I, re I literally remember this day um, and it, it kind of just like snowballed from there. Like I researched every internship, every company in my local area um, that I could work for and really just put myself in the best position to, to work in the industry. Yeah, I love that. I love that you had that drive from like early o'clock and you kind of knew. It took me a long time to figure out what I wanted to do. And I think I just did. Um, but it's nice that you had that clarity from a very early age. Um, okay, so now that you put yourself in position to get the opportunity to get into the cosmetics industry, you know, you do your thing, graduate school, boom, you got an internship at L'Oreal, right? So um, what is your, like, what's your pet product? What's your favorite formulation one that you just love to do um so like one of my favorite products that i developed myself or well it could be both when you develop yourself or a particular type of formula you just like to create a particular type of product you like to create so my favorite formula that i i've worked on is the CeraVe two percent salicylic acid cleanser um this was my first otc product um yes. which meant like it had to go through like a it, an extra set of testing, right, to, to be compliant with like the OTC guidelines and different things like that. And that was my favorite formula because I really remember um, there was like, a, we had one formula that we, that was going to be the, the launch when I inherited the project, but we realized over time the formula wasn't necessarily stable. And when you're going against time and now you have a formula that's not stable, you don't necessarily know when the formula is not stable. It's not, you're not going to know until a month you know, 10 weeks later. So that's like eight, 10 weeks of time you lost. So how do you circle back and develop a formula that is more stable um, to meet your launch timing? And that was like one of the things I had to do was really sit down and look at the, the formula at hand and, and figure out what parts of it we could change, um, what surfactant systems would work best um, while maintaining, again, like the aesthetic. And I think that was like the biggest challenge, but actually having like a frame in which I, I could work in helped me solve the challenge. And that formula in 2021 won an Allure Beauty Award. So to me, it like the award validated all of the hard work. And I know sometimes like, especially like I've developed products that never got an award or like launched and then were canceled like a, a, a year later. Um, or sometimes you develop a product and it doesn't launch at all. So it's like not necessarily taking like your your projects too personally, but really understanding like what makes sense for the brand at the moment. And again, what's meant to be will be. And like people really loving that formula makes me feel really good about myself as a formulator. Um, but in terms of product types, I, I love to make, I actually really like to make um, shampoos and conditioners because I, there was one time I was working on a purple shampoo and conditioner project. I had to make the shampoo and conditioner every day. So like we were having wow. um, processing challenges. So I lit every day I had to make it and make different changes to, to optimize the process. And over time, I just fell in love with like, I love the way shampoos smell, first of all. I love like the texture, especially when they're like pearlized and they're like mixing in the beaker. They just look so pretty. Like, and like, I, I really, I think formulating is like cooking, right? So knowing when to heat up the batch, knowing when to mix it, how long to mix it for, when to add in your ingredients, when to add in fragrance is like a really big deal. Um, but I love like when the formula like cools down and then it takes its final form. Like that's one of my favorite parts of, of batching. Cool. Sounds, <laughs> that sound, sound like, you know, like you're cooking in a kitchen and you know, you're just seeing your food come together. So that's really cool. Exactly. Okay. So, all right, so let's talk about product development, right? Uh, if, if I'm using the correct term, I don't know if that means something different in the beauty world, but you will, you will guide me here. So, okay. where, so where do I even begin if I want to develop my own beauty product? Like, should I come with an idea? Should I, where, where, where should that be? Give us a walkthrough, 
if you have to do that. Yeah. So I think the first part of product development is understanding where you want the product to sit, like what product category, right? So I always say it's better to start with something that's more personal to you because the relationship that you have, the the ambition that you have, like the passion, the passion you have behind your, your first product is going to be what sets your brand apart from anything else. So if you're really passionate about skincare, I would tell you to develop a skincare product or like a serum, something that's like really easy to start with. And then when you, you know, when you're evaluating it, when you're testing it, when you're making iterations, you actually have a point of, of per, like you have a perspective on it, right? Like, does it work for you? Does it not work for you? Like, what is it that you want to see that you're not currently seeing on the market? Um, and I think too, I understanding where you want the product to sit, right? So if you want to sell a serum for $30, well, you need to look at what $30 serums look like, what they feel like, what they smell like. What is it that you can do differently with the serum that you want to launch? Um, then I would consider like different ingredient stories that you want to play, different textures, what type of packaging you want to leverage. Like serums typically come in like a pump or like a dropper, right? Like what works best for you um, in terms of how you anticipate using it and how you want to like, again, set your brand apart. I think in each step of product development, brand distinction should always be like the, the top point. Like, okay, so we're going to use these ingredients because no one else is using them or maybe other people are using them, but not in this specific combination or in this format, right? So how can you keep your brand distinctive from product, pack, um, brand name, different things like that through, throughout the cycle. And I think um, also thinking of like how to sell your product differently, right? So D to C is always the easiest, right? But are there other avenues in which you can consider selling your product, right? Like I think online is always a great start, but I think sometimes too, we overlook different markets. Like for example, if I'm launching, if I'm going to launch a cleanser, or something for acne, like let's say I was just going to do a brand today, I would work with college students because those that's a population, right? They, they're they always looking for new products. They haven't like entered like the age where they're like tried and true, right? They're always looking for what's new, what's fun, what's catchy. I would position yeah. a product to them and I'd work with a local university, a local like organization of like young women at the university say, oh, like, okay, like what do you guys like about this product? What don't you like about the product? Because I think the other trend I'm seeing in beauty right now is like community driven product development. So if you look at yeah. brands like Glow Recipe, um, Versed, what's the other one? There's another brand, um, Glossy Egg. They get a lot of feedback and direction for their next couple SKUs from their actual audience. They're not launching anything the audience hasn't already asked for. And I think that's really, really big in terms yeah. of building a sustainable product pipeline. Oh yeah, I think, oh, that, you just gave like 10 gems there. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. And I, and I love what you said about, you know, other ways to sell. So I know you said D2C, so for those who, who are not familiar, that means direct to consumer, right? So yeah. there are many ways. So like I see the idea of launching, I actually I interviewed as somebody, of probably a month or two ago and he launched his product in a market right in a pop-up weekend yeah. market that's where he launched his product and but you know because he's versed in branding and so on he really presented a very polished finish and you know he worked along with a lab to develop his formula you know what i mean and he took his time too so i so i agree with you 100 that there are different ways to launch every every it's not a one size fits all type of thing yeah and for sure and i think people people could definitely like appreciate that that somebody and also like it. online marketplaces too right like i think the barrier to entry can be lower there than like a i mean everybody wants to be in sephora everybody wants to be in ulta don't get me wrong but i think for small brands partnering with niche retailers is also a great idea so partnering with the retailer that um, like really fits like what your brand's vision is, right? So yeah. brand, um, retailers like Violet Ray, um, Credo, Blue Mer Mercury, like they only work with certain brands, right? Because it fits like what their vision is. So finding yeah. a retailer that aligns with your vision and, and your ethos in the ethos of your brand can also make you go a long way as well. But also like, I think 
One of my favorite apps right now is Flip. Anytime I talk to anybody in the beauty industry, I mention this app, but it's like a TikTok like app where um, content creators can make content based on products that they bought through the app specifically. And one thing yeah. I like about the app is they, they are open to working with smaller brands. They work with small brands, medium sized, big brands. But the goal is to basically close the loop on um, content, like product driven content. So you can only yeah. purchase through the app. Like you don't have to leave the app to complete your purchase like you would on TikTok. Um, yeah. And the other good thing is like the, the app allows content creators to um, make money from each, you know, sale of the product. Like even if you're a macro influencer or a micro influencer, you have an equal chance at, at making money. I think that that's yeah. really cool. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that's that's great. I, I, I noticed that leverage enough community to make to to drive product sales you know flip yeah. super great newness all these all these platforms um are driving that i think we just need one of the caribbean because you know you know we don't have access you know they shut us out it's okay you know whatever we will make, you can do it for yourself yeah we can do one you know i just have to find the right developer to create that kind of platform for me developer are you out there find me you know we could do that for sure sas is where it's at we're you looking know for I mean? you. <laughs> exactly we are looking for you you know what i mean okay so let's talk about timeline for developing a product right now i know we may have some people who you know they have a bright idea and they come they're super enthusiastic about getting their formula crafted and onto the market. But I want you to paint a very realistic picture for what, in terms of time to formulate a product, what does that look like? I, I don't want to say on average, because I'm sure you're going to say everything is different, but just paint a realistic picture for, you know, the timeline, somebody wants to get something onto the market. I think they should give themselves, um, well, I, again, I, I know you said you didn't want me to say it depends, but it, I will say it depends based on, um, how they're doing it. Like if they're like, like you made the comment of like someone doing it at home in their kitchen, right? Mm -hmm. You could get something out in like six, nine months. One, you want to make sure the product passes stability testing. Like you're not just putting it together, putting it in the bottle and then selling it immediately, right? Because what if the, the next week, like, you know, after somebody purchases it, it separates. So giving yourself time to do stability testing, giving yourself time to to make sure it's compatible in the packaging that you choose long term. Um, but if you're working with more like an established private lab, I would definitely say you need to give yourself um, a year to maybe like 16 months because, you know, they're going to be developing the formula on bench, sending you different prototypes. It's going to be an iterative process. There might be ingredients that may not necessarily be available at the time. They too will have to do stability testing. You still have to do testing with how compatible it is in your packaging. You'll do microbial testing. You'll do safety testing, um, clinical testing, depending on what the product is. Um, and then you want to make sure your product, depending on how many units you want to make, you want to make sure your product can scale up. And so with scaling up, you know, you have to be cognizant of like minimum order quantities and like what the vendor you're working with, um, how, how much they're willing to do for you. And so like, that's the difference. It's like, when you're working with a private lab, you might be required to make 5,000 units. Is that something you're ready for? Is that something like, do you know if you could sell 5,000 units in the first three months, in the first, uh, you know, six months? Like, what does that look like for your, your consumer? And I think for someone maybe wanting to start out a little bit smaller, I would say do it yourself. Like, try it yourself um, at home, making sure, like, you know, you're taking right, the right precautions, but so that way you don't over, over invest or, or have too many products on hand where it's like you're not able to sell them fast enough, right? So yeah. I would say start small, see where demand is, and then try scaling up to, to get more units. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So sage advice there for sure, because you know you definitely don't want to be in a place where you spend all of your money on this product and then... Mm, it's not and really you're just working. sitting on yeah you're sitting on inventory, inventory. yeah yeah money yeah. is tied up in inventory you know you can't get it off your hands you know um uh, okay so i heard you mention the term unstable unstable before so what are some of the things that could cause a formula to i guess fail or become unstable while either in production post-production what how does it work yeah so stability is um like a, a test that basically assesses your 
your formula is, um, I don't want to say stableness, but how, <laughs> how stable your formula is over time and different temperature points. And the reason you want to conduct this is you have to understand that sure you're, all right, so I have this lip gloss right now. It's like ambient temperature in my apartment, but this is not where the temperature is going to be at all times, right? So you're factoring in if, you know, you're in an elevated temperature condition for too long in like a distribution center, or if it's on shelf at a store and their AC is out or something like that, like where in which um, from the time the product is made to when the consumer gets it, you're basically tortured testing the formula to see how stable it can be. Um, things that I've seen crash, like stability are like, um, your pH is is off. So whether your pH is too high or too low, it causes an instability in the formula and the formula can crash. Or you have active ingredients and they might be in at too high of a percentage. Um, and the system may not necessarily be thick enough to contain the actives at that concentration. So you'll see like product separation or depending on the type of product, you might um, see like weight loss, right? And so you have to optimize the system from all aspects to make it stable. So you're optimizing the thickness, you're optimizing um, the density, you're optimizing the pH to make sure that this system, regardless of what temperature it is, doesn't shift too far away from the standard. Mm. Okay. All right. Good to know. And I, and I suppose when you were speaking there, I was thinking, supposing some of these products are made for export, they come into countries like Trinidad, it's where it's hot. Exactly. You know? um, so that's so why you would want to make sure, like, for example, you want to make sure like um, like a cleanser or something. You want to stick it in an oven or something, not like an oven at home, but like there's stability chambers where it's set yeah. to a ter certain temperature. And you want to see, okay, after two weeks, after one month, after eight months, um, what does the formula look like? So long as, you know, it's not like separated, there's not, sometimes you'll see if, if it's not preserved correctly, you might see um, like bacterial growth in there, but you want to make sure that your formula is stable over time. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So, and, and I don't know if this is the same thing, but I heard you talk about, I heard you use the term performance. Um, could you explain what is meant when you talk about the performance of a product and what are some of the things that contribute to performance? Sure. So um, in the case of a cleanser, for example, when you're assessing mm -hmm. performance, um, let's say it's supposed to be a makeup removing cleanser. Well, you want to make sure that even after one month, it's still removing your makeup to the same capacity that it was when you first made the batch. Or um, you're assessing lather and foam, right? Like the foam is not like depreciating as the formula ages, right? Because if in one month the, the foam is not as strong as it was when you first developed it, well, then by the time the consumer gets it, it what are, you know, like it's not even going to give them the same performance you once anticipated in the lab. Um, yeah. Like different things like, uh, like uh, how it feels in your hand. Like as a formula, I would say ages, there are certain parameters that will shift, but do they shift within um, a, a range that's considered acceptable? And that range is different for every type of product. Yeah. It was, it's interesting because I bought this thing. I think yes. it's a made in China. <laughs> Some right? And um, this thing has been wreaking havoc on my lips. I cannot oh, really? wear it anymore. It, yes. And I'm thinking, why are my lips so dry? And then I realized it's not was dry. It it's always like cute. that, like when you first bought the product? What? The, the irony is, I think I may have bought this before and it seemed to work fine, but now I bought it this time, so I don't know what has changed. Mm. And I don't know if it's me or if it's the product, but now I understand performance and this is not performing very well at all. And sometimes that happens. And products yeah. are like reformulated all the time because like regulations change, maybe there's a, a sourcing problem with some of the raw materials involved. And, and if you ever had like a, a favorite product and then one day... You were like, I don't know. Like, you're not crazy. Sometimes the formulas do change. Okay. I wanted to ask you that if, if people ever, like, you know, change, they come back and they change things or whatever the case may be. Yeah. You know? Often you have to sometimes because of regulations or because of, like I said, sometimes raw materials can be discontinued by the yeah. initial supplier or, you know, there's a multitude of reasons why um, you'd have to reformulate. Uh, maybe there's like a safety concern on one of the ingredients. Um, 
But sometimes brands choose to disclose that they change the formula and sometimes they don't, depending on the formula. They may or may not say so. Yes. Hmm. Well, sometimes must have changed that. Okay. So, um, okay. So what would you say is some of the biggest misconceptions about cosmetic formulation that you think people need to correct before they embark upon the journey of creating their own product? Um, I think one of the biggest misconceptions I see is um, preservative free products. I think that those are like extremely like dangerous. Um, you always need preservatives in products. I think that's like the biggest understatement ever because you have to think of like the environment in which you're using the product. So for example, a lip gloss, I'm literally putting the wand on my lip and dipping it back into the formula. So yes. like you have like, you know, like you can't not have a preservative system in something like that because who, who knows what was on my lips all day. I'm like eating, I'm outside, I'm, you know, like, so it's like, you have to make sure like your products are, are preserved. Um, and the other thing I think I see a lot of are like misleading ingredient lists, especially with like smaller brands. Um, I'll notice they may not disclose the ingredients in the right order. So like one of the biggest things is like, you have to disclose the ingredients in decreasing concentration. So it's not just like the star ingredients that you put first. You actually have to say what was like the most used, second most used, third most used, and so on, up until 1%. And then you're free to arrange them in um, no particular order, so long as they're used under 1%. Um, and I think that's really important because I see it, I see it all the time. Like products I'll buy, for example, I got my nails done and they were selling like a scrub and they just had the name of the scrub. They never said what was in the scrub. I'm like, that's crazy because... God mm -hmm. forbid something happened. Somebody has like a reaction. Sure. You yeah. never disclosed what was in there. Like that's a huge like FDA violation there. Um, yeah. And I, I actually see that a lot. I see that yeah. all the time. Or not telling the consumer um, how long to use the product for. So products have what are called period after opening. And it's like how long based on stability testing you can use the product after you've opened it. Like you have to think of opening the product as like breaking the seal, right? So after you break the seal, there is a time period for when you're allowed to, to use the product. And for things like um, makeup, sometimes the period after opening is actually shorter than you might think. Um, so just being conscious of that across uh, across any brand that's developing products for sure. Mm, okay. All right, guys. So if you're just joining us, we are speaking with Manessa Lorma Just. Vanessa Lowe, as she has it on the screen there, cosmetic chemist and beauty scientist, who is giving us a pretty much a masterclass um, in cosmetic, well, not formulation per se, but the things that affect it and some of the um, concepts around cosmetic formulation and how these things can affect the products that you produce for your beauty brand. So definitely you want to share this stream with somebody who you know may, may find it useful who's thinking about launching something new, who is, who may have been trying and it's just not working out and they're trying to figure out why can't I get this right? So maybe something that Manessa will say tonight will give you your answer. All right, Manessa, so now I know sometimes chemists create like products, I, bases, I don't know if that's what they call them. Yeah. Yeah, uh, bases. Oh, okay, good, good. <laughs> and um, and they can kind of tweak accordingly, right? So based on the, what the client wants, you can develop something from scratch. What are some of the pros and cons of of each one of these? And um, what would you advise people to get who is just starting out? So, um, okay, so one part is like okay, working off of a base that's only practical up to like certain things. So, for example, if you want an acne cleanser. You can't use the same base as like um, like a milky cleanser, right? Like these are there are two different bases. They require two different like act actives to to meet the performance that the consumer, the client is looking for. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it depends on like I would say like okay, if you're doing like a body care line and all you're changing is the fragrance, for example, like a company like Bath and Body Works, they would typically have the same body wash. And they just change the fragrance because that's their point of distinction. Like you're buying yes. the different formulas because of how they smell, not because one 
like more is more lathering than the other. That's not the point of distinction for that brand. So it really depends on like what you're interested in doing. Um, I would say the pro with doing something like that, like working off of a base or going the private label route is that it might cost less money up front. Like getting a completely customized formula is, is a bit expensive. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Um, and then depending on all the other mod modifications you want, each part, like either even if you're working with a private formulator or a private lab in entirety, they have different pricing structures, right? Based on what it is that you want. So they might give you the first prototype at one, one cost, but depending on how many changes you want to make, they might cap the number of changes. They might charge you incrementally more per change. So it really goes back to what makes the most financial sense for you and what you're looking to do with your brand. Mm, yeah. 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 So, cause I, I think about that and I think about, cause like, okay, the same person I was telling you about, he, he created a hair care line, but there was an existing product that he found that wasn't working as well as it should have. Okay. So I suppose he, I don't want to say he used the existing product as a base, but he, I guess he kind of did. You know, yeah, you and it, the most, and it, it that's not necessarily like a bad thing, right? Because, for example, if you're looking at sulfated shampoo, I mean, they all have the same um SLS, right? So it's like that ingredient is common in all sulfated shampoos. It's just like, what is it that you're changing, right? Like, are you changing the texture? Are you changing the feel? Are you, you know, changing the fragrance? Are you changing how thick it is, how thin it is? Like, it, it's like you kind of you only have but so many ingredients to start with, but you yeah. do change certain ingredients, certain concentrations to end up with a product that works for you. Um, the only thing is like, if you're working off of a formula that maybe is like patent protected, then that mm -hmm. gets into, into tricky territory because yeah. um, you can be sued um, for patent infringement. Yes. Uh, so yeah, that's why I thought it would have been like kind of tricky. Uh, to kind of kind of take a like a a base that's on the market, so to speak, and make like turn it as the base. For yeah, you. I would say so long it's so long as it's not patent protected. Um, right, it's not not like illegal to do that. Reverse engineering products is um, it's not like the hardest thing in the world once you realize like what each ingredient does. Um, how much of it you can use or not use, you you can pretty much reverse engineer most cosmetic products. Mm, okay, all right. Okay, so I heard you mentioned private labeling. So what do you think of private labeling? Like, do you think brands do themselves a disservice with private labeling? Um, I would say no. It depends if that's like your only barrier to entry. Then, I mean, if you're, if that's what you can do, I would suggest that. But um, I do think though, you do have to figure out, okay, maybe if your first product is a private label, I don't think it's sustainable for an entire line of products to me. I could be completely yeah. wrong, but I think after some point you have to have a point of distinction because consumers do notice. I will say they'll, they'll be like, oh, well, that's like this one. Or especially if you know, like the manufacturer, you can kind of figure out like where the two products are actually similar um, that are on the formula. So I think so long as it's not the entire premise of your brand, it's not a bad thing. Yeah. You know, I there was something that I read somewhere sometime. I don't know if this is true. Was Kylie Cosmetics a private label cosmetic brand in the beginning? Because it's I to me not. a lip kit seems very generic, to be to be honest. Um, I will say I'm not sure. I'll definitely say I, I know I've heard whispers of of the product being very similar to like the ColourPop products, but um, I don't think it was like the actual ColourPop formula and then Kylie's name. I don't know. I, I could be wrong. Okay. <laughs> I just found it the look seemed very generic. It didn't seem... No. But I think to, your, to that point, it's like, that's how she started the brand. Let's say if it was the case, she started yeah. the brand off of private label, but now I'm assuming these formulas, especially with more of like the Kylie skin stuff, I would almost assume that they have to be a little bit more customized instead of like a, a, a the lipstick being like a, the private label. You get what I'm saying? Like yeah. she's been able to develop so many other products that yeah. I'm pretty sure they're they're getting more customized at this point. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. 
All right. So you know what? Um, in all that you're doing, right? I am sure there has to be a point where uh, we talked about this a couple of times before. You know where the chemistry and the consumer meets. You know, and that point typically is the marketing point, right? And um, so, talk a little bit more about what it was like to work with the marketing team, because you said you wanted to get on the PD team because you needed to have that communication, you needed to have that link, right? So when you were at L'Oreal, a former Johnson & Johnson, explain how, how the market research helped to inform uh, the formulation, so just so people could have a clear understanding of how the two come together. Because, yeah. because I find a lot of times with new brands, they tend to kind of hop, skip over the market research. They do it too fast. I need to spend a little bit more time there. So if you could explain that a bit, that would be so helpful and useful. Yeah. No, I think there's several ways you could do market research, right? I think for me, um, because the price point of products, I typically like fall within like the Sephora, Ulta. I go to Sephora and Ulta and literally take notes and pictures on my phone. Like, oh, I like the way that this brand did this packaging or communication in a certain way where you'll start to see like certain ingredients trending. Um, and I think understanding okay, well, why is this brand doing this versus this brand doing that, right? So you can do market research from a category perspective or individual brands, right? So identifying who your competitors are from a brand perspective and saying, okay, they're doing this, 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 but they're not doing this. And then the overall category, skincare, being another way to say, okay, well, what's happening in skincare overall? Um, the perfect example is actually seen in the hair care industry where- Brands are coming out with shampoos and conditioners for years. And then all of a sudden, people are like, oh, but I want to care for my scalp because skincare was such a having such a big moment that your scalp is still skin. So now there's it's called skinification of hair where people now you'll see tons of scalp scrubs, scalp detox. That's like crazy in the hair care industry right now. And it's wow. like, how are you either you're either doing another scalp scrub or a scalp serum or you're trying to find a product that caters to the scalp in a very different way. And I think what we saw was like the, the concept of like a scrub being used on the scalp you that had never really been prominent at the time. And now like almost every brand has a scalp scrub. So like now that has become the gold standard. Um, but like really understanding like, okay, whether it's like where you're shopping, where your like product brand would fall, what's changing in that space? Um, I think too, in terms of market, like our marketing teams would always come to us with data, right? So it's a little bit easier when the brand is a bit more established and you can leverage like search data or like online reviews to say like, oh, okay, maybe they're not necessarily enjoying the product we just launched the way that, that we should. We're, what are points that we can revisit? For example, I developed a, a shampoo and we thought it smelled amazing, like we thought it smelled great. And that's one of the things about fragrance is like, it's very nuanced to the user. So we launched the fragrance. We think it smells good. We get feedback three months later. Everybody thinks the shampoo smells like fish. And we're like, what? Like, I didn't, I didn't smell oceany. It didn't smell like anything like that. We had to test the shampoo with a lot of different like fragrance evaluators. And they came back and said that they agreed that there's like a, a very like minimal like marine note and we're like what so like then it made sense why the consumer was like oh yeah that it smells like fish but like because everybody's noses are extremely sensitive like your your sense of smell is based on your personal experience it's based on a lot of like the different receptors that are we don't both each have the same receptor even me and my sister may not have the same receptors um and it's like very specific to you. So how you smell is literally a personal experience um, based on things you've been exposed to throughout your life. And so understanding different things like that as well. Um, but I would say like marketing overall is is a, a very interesting place because it's more than just the product. It's more than just the price. Like it's literally this matrix of product placement, um, promotion and price. Like it's like all the factors together determine how you market the product oh yes oh yes consumption the journey where people find it where they see it 
Yeah. What memory they have? What memory they have tied to a fragrance? If it's tied to like somebody who you just can't stand, and like, oh, I don't like this product anymore. Right. Like yeah. for me, I cannot smell coconut. I really? literally, oh my god, it makes me nauseous. But I drink coconut water all the time. <laughs> so I'm like, it doesn't make sense. It does. I literally cannot. If I spray something that has coconut, I want to throw up. Really? Yeah. Wow. No, but, but that's true. And you know, for some people, like we 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 had a fragrance, um, I would call her a fragrance guru on this program a couple of months ago. And she talked about, you know, how the the pheromones in your own body will interact differently. Um, so like when she sells people fragrance, she she always encourages them to buy a small decant first and then see if they like it. So buy a few decants so if you like it, yeah. then buy the bigger bottle. She always tells them the day before they marry. I don't know if you're looking, but that's, uh -huh. that's so know. funny. Yeah, she says, date before you marry because divorce is expensive. That's what she always says. So get a small <laughs> one, see what you like. And because you know, testing something in a store is not is not enough. You need to actually wear the thing for a period of time, see how it interacts with your body, and then you can determine whether or not it is good yeah. for you. Yeah, so that's true. All right, so I just want to take a moment, say hi to the people who are watching. Drop some lipstick um, emojis in the comments. If you are there, I can see you. I see the numbers on the screen. Um, let me know that you're here. Let me know if you're enjoying this conversation. I also want to remind you about the giveaway we have for from My Beach, My Water, the canvas tote, right? It is simple to enter. Just follow the J Monster Branding Facebook page. Drop some lipstick emojis in the comments and tell us in the comments for sustainable products from the My Beach, My Water store. Even if you're watching this on the replay, put hashtag replay and let us know that you are here and you're entering this competition. You can win one of three canvas totes sponsored by My Beach, My Water. All right. Um, okay. Okay, Manessa. So let's keep it going here. And so, okay. So be be because you have um formulated for brands like L'Oreal you know that they sell worldwide I want to talk a little bit about standards right so you'd have had to meet standards I'm sure for multiple countries um so what are some of the differences in the US and the EU market for example that people should remember in terms of standards for cosmetics oh oh this is such a great question so um each country like you said they essentially have their own set of regulations and one of the things that we would do, especially when I was at L'Oreal, depending on the brand, we would say, okay, are we launching globally or we're only launching in the U.S.? And depending yeah. on which region we want to launch for, we are able to use certain ingredients or not use certain ingredients. And for example, in like um, the EU, sunscreen is not like an OTC product. It's treated like a regular cosmetic product. So it's easier to launch a sunscreen in EU it's like way, actually way easier to launch a sunscreen in EU than it is to launch one in America because you have to abide by the FDA monographs for, for sunscreens, right? And that's like- Oh, I did not even know that. So it's an OTC product yeah. in the United States. Yeah, so to launch sunscreen, it's considered an OTC product here in the US. Um, and so you have to really understand like where it is you want to position your product. I always say like, I think for small brands, it's better to just start with like your local regulations because you want to build the momentum and buy-in for your local consumers. And then as the product and brand grows locally, you can think about positioning yourself for more of like a global launch. I think trying to go global first is, um, is it's a harder challenge and it yeah. might overwhelm somebody that's just starting out, right? So like start small, get the buy-in from your local market, um, but also understand too that regulations change. So regulations can change in your local market. They can change in China in the next two years. Keeping in mind what your growth strategy is long-term will help you decide, okay, well, which market do I necessarily want to position my product for? Mm, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So guys, so I think it's worthwhile, especially for those of us who may not necessarily be working with a lab, research is the key. You have to get, your, so this is all part of your brand research as, as a matter of fact, right? It's not just researching what the, what the consumer wants. You have to understand what the market needs as well. So 
market research, research for your brand includes all of those pieces. Brand strategy includes those pieces as well, right? Exactly. Um, all right, so let's talk specifically about... Now, I don't know if at any point in time you might decide to come up with a formulation, you know. I mean, you have all of the keys right there. <laughs> um, or you know anybody from the Caribbean, you're a Caribbean girl, um, who will be looking to export to the States. Now, if somebody is in this region and they're looking to export to the States, what do you think some of the most important standards for cosmetics in the United States in particular are that people sh really should be paying attention to? Um, I definitely think going back to our conversation about transparency in terms of ingredients, um, not only is this a requirement when you, you sell in the U.S., I think it's also something that consumers are demanding more and more. So really having a story into why you're using certain ingredients and making it accessible for your consumer. So whether it's not, so for example, a product like this, you cannot actually see the ingredients because, well, it doesn't make sense for the pack. But when you consider the secondary pack, which is like when you buy this lip gloss, you bought it in a box. Well, then yeah. your ingredient list needs to at least be on the secondary pack if it can't fit mm. on the primary pack. Um, I think also keeping in mind like just logistical challenges too. Like, okay, so you're exporting from one region. Well, what does the time frame look like from when it goes through customs? Like making sure you have all your customs paperwork for the type of product that you're selling because each product type has its own like chemical hazard classification, right? So depending on what level of active ingredients you might have, you might need additional paperwork. Um, so making sure you have a, a full grasp on what essential hazards would be posed per product um, so that you don't get any hiccups in, in customs or, or anything like that. Like, so not only making sure like you're communicating transparency on pack, but also having like your documentation in line because you would never want it to get to a point like you're ready to export your product is just sitting in customs and it can't be released because you don't have the proper documentation. Oh, that would be terrible. Oh my gosh. All yeah. right. So, so we have Ramona. Good night, ladies. Hi, Ramona. Thanks so much for dropping your lipstick emojis and sharing the stream. Always a faithful viewer every week. Appreciate you. Right. Um, all right. So, whew. customs, eh? <laughs> Just, <you> know, <laughs> um, okay. So, you, you mentioned something before, but I want to ask this if you've ever witnessed, like, or know of a case of a wear product had to be pulled from the shelf, and like, for what reason what, what that, would that have been, you know? I see that all the time. Um, like, I, so one thing I do, I read, I read a lot about industry right um there was a product the other day it was a moisturizer um it got recalled because it was growing bacteria inside um yeah and again that goes down it goes back to your preservative system and so um when you think about where the product is going to be stored right well what potential risk are there for that so if you're storing for example all my cosmetics are typically in my bathroom well, when I shower, I take really hot showers, so it gets nice and it gets steamy in there, like which I like. But what does that mean when I have um, uh, an eye cream just open on my counter, right? Like, yeah. is my eye cream going to not grow mold? Like, is it going to be okay given the environment that it sits in? Um, a yeah. lot of times, too, products can be recalled because of packaging defects. Like sometimes, like um, different components, for example, pumps are very complicated. And depending on what is in the formula, it might um, cause like erosion within the pump or it might break in transit and different things like that. So there are like a wide reason, wide variety of reasons like products can get recalled, but um, that, that does happen. And I think, again, that's why having like an organization like the FDA in place that regularly looks at products on the market is really important because they are the body that makes those recalls um, or like the brands themselves, but oftentimes it's it's due to like a safety or, or consumer complaint that the product gets recalled. That's recalled. Yeah, yeah. I just wish, I mean, we have chemistry, food and drug. I just wish they were like, you know, get their act together like more tightly. <laughs> it's just yeah. really crazy when, you know, but you know, Caribbean things, you know, it is, you know, we are slowly getting there. 
Um, there's something I said that, that I thought about, and I wanted to ask your opinion on this, right? Now you mentioned the the concept of people not necessarily giving too much credence to preservatives, and you, you think that's a big misconception that people need to correct. Now, I know there's this whole idea of natural and organic and that kind of thing. Uh, I see a lot of people putting that forward, but I always wonder, does that even make sense to tell people that things are organic? Because in my mind, formulations do need some level of chemicals <laughs> to keep things stable. You know, they do need some level of they need something. It's not all, you know, all the, the fruit and the vegetables inside of your thing is not just going to be, you know, it's not going to make sense. Even if, listen, if I if I get some preserved fruit, it's going to last me way longer than a fresh fruit. It just is what it is, right? So talk to us a little bit about what you think about the whole notion of organic and that whole movement. And um, does it even make sense when people sell you, sell you things that are, 100% organic. Are they selling you a dream? So I, this is my favorite thing to talk about in this industry <laughs> because um, I, I'm, I just want to say everything is rooted in, in chemicals in nature, right? So like whether it's like uh, citric acid, literally from like a lemon, it's still citric acid, right? The sourcing is just like, whether it's synthetic or natural, but all things have a chemical makeup. We are made up of chemicals. Like DNA is actually like nucleic acids. Like that, those are chemicals, right? So like water mm -hmm. technically is a chemical. And I think it's the language around the words that really causes this hysteria, right? Like mm -hmm. to your point, are you really taking like an avocado, banana and olive oil and mashing that up and thinking, it's not going to turn brown. Like, of course it's going to turn brown, but like yeah. that's why we need a preservative to make sure it stays safe for a long period of time. And like, I think what you'll see in the industry right now is there's a lot of language that's being used like plant derived. So like it could be plant derived in terms of like starting material, but then it's like introduced and, and goes um, through like a, a chemical process to be either be refined, extracted or, um, reacted with something else to give you like the end material that's then used in the formulation right but i think i agree like i i would i don't use products that are like 100 organic because to me as a formula that doesn't make sense um i think it, they can sometimes be misleading because well what is your organic preservative here and like how efficacious is it like you know like I, i'm always wary of different things like that um but I think more like plant derived, naturally derived are like better terms to use than organic, um, just because it makes sense. Like, yeah, you're using um, a surfactant and most of the time the starting ingredient comes from a coconut tree. So it is plant derived. It, it can be naturally derived if there's no other like synthetics used in the process. But even those terms too, like the industry has very specific um legalities on what that actually means right so i think it's again just understanding what what is the long-term goal of the brand like if you are selling something that's 100 percent organic and you've deemed it safe well how how much further can you go than like your local community i i would say with something like that because again if you're shipping it overseas you're you know it's going through customs it's sitting in a warehouse is it going to be stable over time is what I, I would implore um, someone to think about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I got you. I got you. <laughs> okay. So Again, so now really is, is key. Formulas have to be stable. Absolutely. So Janelle say, hello, ladies. Hi, Janelle. Nice to see you tonight. Dropping your lipstick. Lipsticks in the, in the comments. All right. So... We are looking to land this plane and bring things to a close. So, Manasa, my final question for you is around the kitchen formulator. So, you know, in the world of, you know, where YouTube University is training everybody, you know, everybody is like a self-made formulator. <laughs> and you know what? There's a, there's a part of me that, I mean, I have um, I have mixed feelings on this because you know sometimes okay. So as I'm as a makeup artist, and I do like this because I'm not really practicing. I learn, I'm qualified, but I very rarely practice. Um, 
I, I paid and I went to school to learn this. But then there are people who look on YouTube, do it. And I mean, they're makeup artists from, a, from an artistry point of view. But then when it comes down to the mechanics and the science of the thing, it's completely different. So how do you feel about, uh, I guess, the kitchen formulators? You know what I mean? I guess chemistry being democratized is no longer confined to a lab and to a few chemists. You know, everybody, as long as you can mix on YouTube, you can do that. You know, what would you advise them to, to do, like to keep compliant, to keep safe? And how do you feel about that? Um, I would just say, just continue doing your research. I don't think there's anything wrong with someone, you know, DIYing products at, you know, in their kitchen. I mean, that's how most, like, if we think of like Madam CJ Walker, right? She didn't mm -hmm. have a lab, but she was able to start somehow. Um, mm -hmm. Even the founder of Meow, like she didn't have a lab, but she started like starting in a way that makes the most sense. Like you can research formulas online. You can research, okay, like what are different, um, they're called functional, like functional ingredients. So you have humectants, you have surfactants, you have um, chelating agents, like understanding, okay, here's like what the five parts of a formula are. Here's what common ingredients are. Here's things like the industry no longer uses. Like, I think that's the thing, like, Google, I said this earlier, but like Google is my best friend. You can even go Google like um, sample formulas from suppliers. Like they they make all of those things public, but it's just up to you to say, okay, well, I found X, Y, and Z online. I put them together. Again, is it stable? Is it not? Researching, okay, like what is my thickening system? How do I keep my formula from separating? Like it, it is a lot of trial and error. And I don't think just because someone didn't go to school for chemistry, it kind of like gatekeeps, gatekeeps them from doing that. I do think you understand it a little bit differently when you did go to chemistry, go to school for chemistry or studied formulation um, design. But, you know, there's tons of classes. Like you can always sign up for a class. You can sign up for seminars. I would say just stay in the know instead of like only looking at YouTube as a resource or only coming to your own conclusions based on what, you know, you're developing on your own. I would, I would say just continue learning and continue growing for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, guys. So all of the formulators who may be looking at this, just keep doing your thing. Soon enough, you will be fancy like Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> and you may even run your own lab someday soon because it's pretty cool. You might be sitting on your next million. The formula is probably in your hands, right? So definitely you want to do that. So... When I said this has been a fantastic, a real masterclass indeed. And um, any closing words before we before we wrap this up? Yeah, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. This was truly a pleasure. Um, if there's anyone out there that wants to connect, uh, maybe want some feedback on something that they're working on, definitely feel free to message me on LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok. Find me. You know, I'm on the internet. Um, yeah, I'm very responsive, so feel free and we could connect and set something up. She is indeed quite responsive. So, follow Melissa on Instagram, underscore Nessa L O, Nessa Low on TikTok, Melissa Low. This is her website, which is really, as a matter of fact, I want to say for all beautypreneurs, this website is a good example of something that you should all have somewhere where we could find information. You could do your bio as a video, put it on YouTube. That's exactly what Manessa did, right? <laughs> and it makes it so much easier because sometimes, you know, even like to prepare for this show, sometimes I try to do my research, but people send me one line of a bio and I'm dying because I have no idea where to start. I don't know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I don't know. I have to ask them, please, can you give me some more meat? I'm dying, right? So having your own website is key. That's something. I think I'm going to make a TikTok video about that, you know, but... um. You want to do that, you certainly want to position yourself for that. And um, and yeah, and I think it's great. Also, if you're a beauty brand and you know you need support and help or you're not sure what to do, go to my website, take my beauty brand assessment. It's a quiz and it'll tell you exactly where you're at and what help you need. And I'll even give you a couple of free things you can download. All right, guys. So again, thanks so much for joining us tonight on The Lipstick Effect. Vanessa, thanks so much for being here and sharing your chemist chemistry wisdom with us. Of course. And we look forward to seeing you again next week, guys. So join us right here next week on The Lipstick Effect, where we will have yet another amazing guest and more amazing topics around the business of beauty, branding, and 
business. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one, guys. See you next week. <laughs> Bye. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.